About two years ago, I had the idea to uh, write a composition based on some famous paintings that we could see at the uh, Philadelphia Museum of, uh, of the Arts. And the um, first time I came here was about uh, two years, one and a half year ago, where I have seen an amazing collection of uh, paintings, American paintings, European paintings. So my first goal was to select seven paintings. Uh, why seven? I have something with, uh, with seven, but that's for another interview. But um, uh, it was a, a difficult task for me to, uh, to select paintings. Um, I recognize, of course, I saw a lot of European paintings from where I come from, from uh, 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 France, uh, Belgium, Holland, Germany, United Kingdom. Paintings that I grew up with and that was not so interesting for me. I was especially interested in, in American art and uh, artworks that I, I didn't know. So at the end, um, I finished with a short list of 14 paintings of which I had to select another, another seven. And um, it took, took quite a while. Uh, I uh, have seen these paintings uh, many times. I was reading about the artists, about the paintings, etc. So at the end, I came to my final seven that were interesting uh, for me as a composer to translate into uh, music. So this work was actually commissioned by uh, the Chamber Orchestra of uh, Philadelphia. And pictures at an exhibition, it's a, uh, an idea that I didn't invent. Uh, previous centuries, there was like a, a great Russian composer um, who wrote uh, also pictures at an exhibition, uh, Mussorgsky. Um, and these paintings were uh, selected from uh, a friend of his, uh, Victor Hartmann, who passed away. And uh, there was a huge um, exhibition in Russia. So Mussorgsky selected a number of paintings, 12 paintings, and uh, translated them into music. And it was the great French composer, Maurice Ravel, who did the orchestration. So I had that great, great example um, uh, of that masterpiece. And that a little bit inspired me uh, already 20 years ago. I said, yeah, one day I would like to do something like that. So working as a music director in uh, Philadelphia with the Chamber Orchestra of Philadelphia, that was um, a no-brainer and, 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 and a gift that uh, I could uh, work in this fantastic uh, city of Philadelphia with lots of art and especially in the Philadelphia Museum of, uh, of the Arts. So finally, I translated those uh, pictures into music and um, I have seven different uh, musical styles and uh, everything is written for a 32-piece uh, orchestra. And it is with great pleasure that I present you my pictures at an exhibition. I, when I first saw it, it's, it's really an, an amazing, uh, amazing painting. I, I, I didn't know it. When I first saw it, I didn't know who was the painter, what was the subject. But I was walking in this hall where there are like 40, 50 paintings. And, and this particular painting uh, really took my attention. Uh, um, it, first of all, of, of the color, it's very, very, very dark. It's intriguing. Yeah. And then there was like two, two important uh, f things that are happening. Uh, that is this man who I didn't know. Now I know him quite well, but uh, I didn't know who he was. I, 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 I saw it was a doctor. And here I saw some, like a naked, figure, not really knowing what was, what was going on. But I was really, really intrigued by, by, by this person, not knowing whether it's a child or an adult person or a young girl or, or a young man. And also by, by, by that, that person that is like crying, maybe it could be the mother or, or the sister. So as a composer, when I, when I look to a painting, I immediately tried to, to um, translate it into music. And the first thing I heard was actually the heartbeat of this person. If this person, hopefully, yeah, still alive, but after this operation, I don't know what's going to happen. Is this person going to survive? Is this person going to die? So I immediately heard that. <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> that that's so interesting because you don't even know who that person is, and we will never know who that person is. He's a patient in an operating theater, 
anonymous because his face isn't shown. All we see is the part of his body on which the operation is taking place. The real action, of course, the real focus of the painting is on the surgeon himself. And you know what this painting is now, and you know the subject. Now I know the subject, of course. Yeah. Many people say this is probably the most important painting created in America in the 19th century. So, and I think, I think they're right. I think it's an extraordinary statement of ambition by the artist, and we'll talk about him in a moment, but it's also an extraordinary statement about this person and about Philadelphia at a particular moment in time. The subject is Dr. Samuel Gross, who was one of the leading surgeons in the country at the time, and on the faculty of um, the Jefferson Medical School. And he's shown here in his own operating theater, uh, not simply as a surgeon, but also as a teacher. And what uh, has always struck me about this picture, um, and it strikes me every time I see it, is how big it is. Mm -hmm. The portraits come in all sizes, but they rarely come this big. This is truly a monumental picture. He's our size, he's life size, and perhaps even a bit more. And this is meant, this painting is meant to celebrate uh, a great personal achievement, but also the role that Philadelphia played in the advancement of medical science in the 19th century. And it's no surprise that, that Thomas Aikens, the young painter who painted this picture in 1875, did so in order to show it to the world, to the public, on the occasion of the great centennial exposition here in, in Philadelphia in 1876, a great moment for Philadelphia to kind of step out into the light of the world and proclaim its significance as a great American city. Another thing, another detail, it's not even a detail that got my attention, it's the concentration, it's, it's, it's teamwork. It's like Dr. Gross is like thinking about something, but see at the faces, at the hands of all those those uh, assistants, it, they are so concentrated. Everybody is, is doing something. So without his assistance, I think he, he, can, never, he, can, never do, he can never do this, this, uh, this operation. And this is also something I, I used in the composition. So in the counterpoint, that means that all the, all the voices that are communicating with, with each other in the, in the orchestration, they are, they are, everybody is, is important, not only the, the melody line that, that could be represented uh, by Mr. Dr. Gross, but also all the lines underneath, like the inner voices, the basses, the celli, the, the, the second violins, the violas. So it, 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 it's really a, a teamwork and, and the concentration of all those, those people. Everybody's doing one, one little thing, but that is so important in order to, to have a good result uh, uh, in the operation. I hope I'll be able to hear a note that echoes the light glistening on his forehead. That's, for me, the wonderful part yeah. of the painting. So, Dirk, this is another truly great picture in our collection. Winslow Homer, arguably one of the great, great American artists, certainly one of the great painters of the 19th century, began his career as a newspaper illustrator. He knew how to depict action. He knew how to find the most telling moment in a story, and he did so here in this picture called The Lifeline. Um, you've heard that phrase, ripped from the headlines. Mm -hmm. This is one of those subjects, a okay. ship to shore rescue, uh, a very, very brave, brave figure um, who you can't see in, in, in this, you can't see his face in this picture, um, has risked his, his life to go out and, um, and, and bring this woman back to shore and to safety. It's an extraordinary picture, but it really focuses amidst the, you know, the, the, the billowing of the waves and the, 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 all of the wind and the howling of the seas. He, it yeah. focuses on these two figures and their interactions. It's a really extraordinary painting. Well, I, what, 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 what took my attention was, of course, the, the, the subject, the, 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 the rescue, but also the, the energy that is in, the, in, in, in this painting and also the, the danger. Um, um, I made a combination of, of what you see and what you don't see. So what you see is everything like the, the, the movements of the sea and the danger, uh, the wind. Uh, so everybody is really busy in the orchestra. But then you don't know if she's still alive. She's not conscious. She's un unconscious. Sometimes 
she might be conscious. I, I hope she's still alive, and I'm sure she's still alive. So all of a sudden, the music goes away to the background. So everything we see, like like uh, everybody's playing uh, tons of notes and uh, high dynamic, and everybody's busy, 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 busy. And then <coughs> all of a sudden, that goes to the background, and it's like you hear, you still hear one tone, and you go in her mind, and she hears everything that is going on around her head, but she he hears it very, very, very far far away and she has moments of consciousness and unconsciousness and it's that that balance that for me was interesting to translate it into um, into uh, into music um, and you have very strange strange chords when we go into her mind we have very abstract very atonal complex chords but in a very high high register uh, while everything else uh, is very low, a lot of brass, a lot of winds, a lot of percussion, and the strings, they're moving all the time, li like they are just, just following the, the, the movements of the, of the, of the, wa of the waves. Uh, and at some point, you, you will hear the wind. I was, I was just thinking, how, how could I translate the wind into music with, uh, with only having classical uh, instruments? But I, I think I, I, I found a way how to... Uh, Reproduce the the wind and the and the and the and the storm, and you should because the the elements, the waves, the wind, clouds, movement of the sea is the protagonist no, of exactly. the story. Maybe it's mm. even the villain, but Homer had this unique ability to capture the force of nature in a way that nobody has, mm. I think, before. Or sense, mm. and what makes for me, what makes this picture so compelling for me, is that their lives are hanging quite literally by a thread in the middle exactly. of this maelstrom. Mm. It's an extraordinarily dramatic moment, mm. and he captures like a snapshot. Yeah, you yeah. were there. So one couldn't ask for a greater contrast between this and Thomas Moran's Grand, The Grand Canyon. Moran, a great and talented and technically very, very professional painter. Edward Hicks taught himself how to paint. Um, painting was not, uh, not an, a vocation, but actually a, a pastime for him. He was a Quaker preacher. Um, he had a day job as a Quaker preacher, I guess I should say that. Um, but yet today, these are amongst the most coveted and, and most charming paintings we, we have in the collection. Just wonderful things. It reminded me of uh, Rousseau, uh, the Vanier, Rousseau. The French one is a very naive way of, uh, of painting uh, things. But what, what, what surprised me, this is actually um, the main story of this painting, to my opinion, it's in the background. It is. And here you see like the, the, the wild animals with a child, young, young girl, young, young lady. Uh, but actually the, the real story is going on. So as soon as I, I saw the painting, I questioned myself. Those guys, William Penn and some of his uh, colleagues coming from, from England, having a conversation with native Indians. What, what language did they, did they, did they speak? I mean, uh, so I see, I see they have papers, something must be, must be written on, 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 a, on a big sheet of paper, but, but they cannot read. So how, how, how was this going to happen? So um, musically, uh, it was for me a no-brainer to, um, to uh, invent two musical languages, the, 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 the music language from, from the William Penn, the British people, the British uh, kingdom, and then the native Indian uh, music. So actually, the music I wrote for this painting starts with a solo tune uh, played on a native Indian American flute, accompanied by very basic uh, percussion. And the answer to that tune is an, a fiddle playing a British uh, a uh, uh, jig, I mean, like yeah, almost like a, like a dancing thing, you know. And you have actually two musical worlds that uh, are having conversations all the time during the composition, and at the end, they they play together. So they have um, the musicians. Some of the musicians they have to sing, 
a lot of percussion. And then the British are answering with very sophisticated uh, classical European uh, bar Baroque music. Yeah. And um, there was something, so at some point, a struggle going on because of misunderstanding, uh, because they were talking about very important things. I mean, it was about selling the land, giving the land to, 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 to Penn, so they didn't know who those people were, um, in my opinion, at least. Um, so um, that was the, the musical solution I, I had to, to translate this, uh, this painting. And just for one time, I'm leaving that conversation in those two musical languages, concentrating on this where I really, and it's a little bit of blasphemy, but I really go into a impressionistic, uh, a false impressionistic idea just to go away from this conversation, like the music is just thinking, giving the other, the listener the time to reflect on what's going on, and after a while, just going back to this uh, conversation. And the, the highlight of, of the music is that at the end, during the composition, there is no conversation at all because they, they don't understand each other. But at the end, the two themes are played together in harmony. And I'm very proud that I, uh, succeeded in, in my way, in my opinion, to, to translate what is uh, seen in this, uh, on this painting. You know, it's an interesting point that these two worlds, there are two worlds depicted in this painting. One, an historical world of William Penn's treaty with the Indians, which by this time in the early 19th century had become part of the lore of the founding of Pennsylvania and the founding of this country. And then on the other side of the painting, the illustration of a passage from the Bible. And these two worlds exist separately from each other. One's about religion, about the life to come. One is about American history. But they coexist beautifully in this fanciful, fanciful picture yeah. um, by Edward Hicks. It's a, it's a wonderful painting to have in our collection because it says so much about Philadelphia and its history. Certainly the founding myth of William Penn making the treaty with the in, his treaty with the Indians, but also it's about a man, uh, William uh, Edward Hicks rather, uh, who was a, a Quaker minister and part of the history of early Philadelphia and the importance of of Quakers to that history, um, leaving a record of his and a testament to his faith, simple, sublime, and still deeply moving. Mm. So, what drew you to Mark Rothko and the painting in our collection? Well, in general, I always loved uh, Mark uh, Rothko. I was always intrigued by those uh, huge paintings with only one color, two colors, and uh, when you really stare to that painting, it does something with you. Um, there's not, not, not much going on. I mean, uh, it's just like one, one shape or two shapes, two, two forms, two colors com having a conversation w with each other. But the painting that I saw here, the blue and the, and the, and, and the black, that was so intriguing, two very interesting uh, colors. So immediately um, I was thinking of uh, making two different colors in the orchestra with all the colors I have, with all those instruments, making combinations with those instruments. So I, I thought I will divide the orchestra in two parts. One part will represent the uh, black color, which is very dominant on the painting, and the other uh, group of the orchestra will represent the blue one, which, is, which has more light and more, more, more brightness. But when you go closer to the painting, you see that there is an entire world of things moving, moving. You can see the strokes, you can see uh, the... Um, you, you can feel an emotion. It's like you can feel the emotion of the, of, of the painter when he was making strokes with a small brush or a tall brush or fast or, or slow movements. And I was really studying this painting uh, as close as I, as I could. So that means that the, the instruments that are representing the, the, the black color, which is quite sad and, uh, and, and quite depressive, mm -hmm. they are not only playing like one massive big long chord, but there is a vibration going on. So it's just not like a long note, like one color, but within the color, within the musical color, also the, the, the color on the painting, 
there is it, it's vibrating all the time and sometimes as a as a when you watch the painting you can focus on the on the black you can focus on the blue and then you can when you come close you are like very afraid of it when you when you go far away you see the com the conversation the blue makes it all a little bit more 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 soft actually and this is what um, got my attention when i when i saw those those uh, uh, those two interesting colors on Rothko's painting and it was a no brainer to to translate that into into music so there is no melody there is no rhythm you only have sound clouds representing both of the colors but within the sound clouds you have vibrations mm. so th there's no artist in in our collection whose work aspires to the condition of music more than Mark Rothko's does in my opinion when I look at those pictures and I felt this for a long time I think of of tone poems I think of of music and um, almost as you said a kind of equivalent to basic musical structures um, the sounding of a single tone but the kind of infinite variation as you described it that you can achieve within a simple sim within a simple form or by using a simple color no one has done it better in the modern era than Rothko himself You know, Dirk, you couldn't have chosen a more operatic picture than this one to be inspired by. Um, and I'd like to hear you talk about that a bit. But let me ask you a question first. Have you ever been to the Grand Canyon? Yes, and that's the reason why I selected uh, this, this painting. I had no idea how, how big it was. And I was conducting a concert in, uh, in Phoenix. And uh, my partner, Claire, she said, we have to take a day off and go to visit the Grand Canyon. I said, come on, I mean, I have things to do. She said, no, we stopped the time. We have to go there. So it was not, it was not my happiest day, you know, workaholic <laughs> I am, and I had to prepare for concerts. But as I arrived there and I saw it, I started crying like a child. I was like, I was blown away. I had no idea that it was such a huge fan fantastic thing. It was almost like a, like a spiritual moment in my life. It was like, wow. And when I came into that room and I saw this painting, immediately I, I ran to that and I said, wow, fantastic. And it, it, is, it is amazing. Of course, this is something different than, 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 than when you see it live. But um, the, the spirit, I, I could find the same, the same spirit. It is mysterious at the same time. It is epic, it is opera, mm -hmm. it is, um, could be Hollywood. The opening of my music is Hollywood. So the first 10 seconds, it's like a, a Hollywood uh, picture, which, which it is not, of course. But just to give a wrong direction to the, to the audience, that uh, I, I just want to give them a, a wrong idea where the music will, will go yeah. to. So it's like eight bars, Hollywood, and then immediately we go into that mis mysterious, life of that painting you see and i i really start start here with a very long high tone of the of the violence and there was a violin solo but and he's, he's playing uh, bits of a melody and then he stops so there was a lot of emptiness in in the beginning of the of the music and then i go i go downstairs i go to the deepest point of the painting that is probably here down mm -hmm. down the river and then I start a chorale. It's almost religious. I start a chorale. Very low strings. And it's building up, mm -hmm. it's building up. Always the same melody. But I, I really got goosebumps now when I, when I, when I hear my own music. And it's, it's really growing and growing and growing. And in the beginning, as a human being, when you hear the, the melody, you feel like like the center of the universe mm. but as the music is growing you become smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller till yeah you're just the size you have the size of an atom well, and the music is really yeah. breathing and, and lifting you up towards uh, eternity you know that's a perfect response in in my opinion to this painting in the subject no matter how many postcards 
we see or illustrations of the Grand Canyon, when you're there, the experience is different and still takes your breath away. Mm -hmm. No matter how much you think you know it, it has to do with the very things you described, a sense of scale that creates in turn a sense of awe and wonder. How could this be so big and so grand a panorama? A sense of light, a sense of color that Thomas Moran, the painter of this picture, knew how to capture in the American West. So I'm curious to hear what you made of this painting. We're in surrealist country now, uh, and this is a picture full of interesting pieces that don't quite fit together. One has to work really hard to make sense of it. Well, it's um, surrealism and music. I mean, uh, I made different themes for each uh, situation you see. There is a, a, a mathematic book, there is a trident, there is a, a love affair going on between those two figures who seems to be dancing or, or this girl who wants to dance. So here we see two people making, making love, which is probably the place where the artist Manue is uh, spending his life painting. You see the canvas, probably he's making love. On the roof of his, um, of his house, there, there is those wild animals uh, trying to, uh, to destroy each other. There is also the, the wall where you see a, a hole in the wall which represents the war that's going on, the pre-war in Europe. So these are all kind of uh, very interesting uh, figures that inspired me, especially this uh, personage coming from the Commedia dell'arte mm -hmm. with in his head like a light. You don't see any eyes or any ears or whatever, just the just light. Uh, which means that probably it's, it's the brain, it represents the brain. So musically, actually, it was no, not so difficult to translate this into music. At first sight, I have all different themes representing each of the actions, but they're all linked together. And especially these things, uh, if, you, if you watch the second and the third layers of the story, they are actually all connected. Everything starts in a dream. So in my music, I, actually my music starts here. In the in the in the in the um, office in the house of the of the of the painter, and the dream brings you to all kind of weird things at first sight that had nothing to do with each other, but they're all connected. Uh, some of the interesting spots in the music is um, those people they, they they are trying to seduce each other. There is there is a, a love affair going on in his dream again. So and you, you see that that red line here in the lack, maybe it represents a lack, um, inspired me to write a, a ragtime, ragtime that was very popular uh, musical form in those days. But also there is a, a French musette, because this painting was painted in Paris. So there was a, fr a French musette flirting with the American uh, ragtime. There you hear a lot of percussions that are representing, uh, representing the war. There is a huge fight uh, going on. Uh, those stones that apparently have n no meaning at first sight, but they're there for a reason. I don't know which reason that, that Man Ray had, but anyway, I had my reason why those two stones are there. So um, I think um, it's musically very, very interesting. Um, it brings us to Dadaism also, where you hear one minute of a kind of music and then immediately followed by something completely different, other style, other tempo, other orchestration, and, and, and it goes on and it goes on. So here I have I found in this painting 12 different subjects. So in this musical uh, composition, you have 12 different um, themes. There is even a touch of the Marseillaise. Also a bit of the American folk song, National Anthem. Just they have first sight nothing to do with this painting, but they're all connected to each other. So it starts with the dream. We make a huge trip towards everything we see, everything we hear, and at the end we go back from where we come to the uh, house uh, of the uh, of the painter. So controlled chaos. Controlled chaos, absolutely, controlled chaos. And I hope I hear in the composition you've written for this picture 
a lot of humor. Oh, there is a lot. There is a lot of humor. Oh, oh, absolutely. Nothing. Nothing is serious. Uh, there is a lot of a lot of humor. Absolutely. Yeah. So one of the most interesting, and I guess I would say enigmatic paintings that you've chosen is Edward Hopper's Road and Trees. I'm really glad that you did. First of all, because it, it just has come to the museum as a gift within the last year and a half. And it's our first painting by Edward Hopper, who I consider to be one of the great American painters of the, the 20th century. But also, I'm going to come back to that word enigmatic. It's a picture almost about nothing. And the question I have for you is, is how you take a painting that consists of a field of green, a road, and then in, in the, the near distance, um, a, a line of trees, almost the same, one after the next, and then the sky above. That's all. There's not much happening in the painting, but as with Mark Rothko's work, there seems to be every, everything happening in it at mm -hmm. the same time. Well, actually, I'm triggering the fantasy of the listener because you see what you see on the painting, but the painting, it's enormous. It's the entire world. So for me, the painting doesn't stop what is in the frame, but it, it continues, with, at least with my music. So there is very few melody, very few rhythm. It's, it's minimalism. So you go into a dream, you go into a system, and it's like you fall asleep and you go into, you, you go into a dream. Not, nothing is happening, no emotions, um, which is typical for this painter's uh, uh, oeuvre in, in, in general. You see things that are happening, you see figures sitting somewhere having a drink, but they are in a distance. It's like, it's very hard, it's very difficult to connect with those, uh, with those uh, figures that you see on the, on, the, on the paintings. It's like they live in their own world. You have no connection to them. And this is what I want, want to describe with, uh, with, uh, with the music. And it's not only the translation of the painting Trees and Road, but actually of more paintings I have seen of, of this uh, fantastic painter, who is one of my favorite American uh, painters. Um, and th this is only one, one musical style who can represent this and who can translate this. It's um, minimal music. It's like, um, yeah, going to a dream, very few material, very few rhythmical material, melodic material, but again, it goes further than what you see on, on the painting. For me, the painting continues, continues, continues. Well, that, that's it. Minimal though the, the picture may be um, in its parts, there's something about it, and this is true of Hopper's work as a whole, that stays within memory. It strikes a chord with us, and, and it, it's always beyond our grasp to quite figure out what that is. It's the most mysterious thing, just as the way he paints light is, is absolutely mysterious. Mm -hmm. I've never had, uh, I've never encountered uh, a painter who can do more with less and, and, and extract more mystery and wonder sometimes mm -hmm. out of the things we, we think we know and we, we always take for granted. It's mm -hmm. a really fascinating phenomenon. Mm -hmm. So that music will be, will be about less is more. 